So, you want to make an app? It's hard to see why someone wouldn't want to. Well, for starters, everyone's got a phone in their pockets, and every day, you hear about another app making millions of dollars. Great, how do we start? Well, the key components of an app are design and functionality, among other things. And luckily, Apple has you covered with both. In this video, I'm going to be walking you through and giving a detailed explanation of Apple's relatively new user interface framework, SwiftUI. I'm hoping that all developers, beginner and experienced alike can benefit from this video or take away something from my angle or insight into this framework. Okay, let's dive in, but first a small disclaimer. SwiftUI is an Apple-only framework. Now, don't click away just yet, because the topics I'm discussing will be useful for other similar frameworks like React or Flutter. Besides, we aren't Android scrubs anyways. Psh. Okay, that's a joke. They have 80% of the market share, so please don't leave. But before you click off and head back to your mom's couch, subscribe so you can find my Android video that's coming up shortly after this one. All right, let's get started with this phrase. Everything is a view. SwiftUI is what is known as a component-based framework. These have gotten quite popular over the years, and I attribute a lot of SwiftUI success to the fact that it's one, one of these types of frameworks, but also it's very new to the game. Older component-based frameworks like the aforementioned React and Flutter were revolutionary at the time, but not without their flaws. The beautiful thing about SwiftUI is that since it came after, it was able to learn from those flaws. It makes the future of these types of frameworks even more exciting to be a part of. All right, that sounds great, but what do they actually do? Well, these frameworks operate under one main principle. Every UI element is represented by some type. In React, they're called components, Flutter widgets, and SwiftUI views. However, they are all in essence the same thing. They are just parts of the user interface that make up the whole. The way I like to think of them is as follows. There exists some predefined system elements, such as a text element or an image. The way users build up their interfaces is by combining these system elements into a layout. Furthermore, these layouts, or combinations if you will, is itself another UI element. This means that it can again be used in yet another UI element as if it was a system element. This distinction, or lack thereof, between system elements and user-defined elements is the core of these component-based frameworks. Let me repeat again, everything is a view. SwiftUI actually takes this phrase even further when it comes to modifiers, but we'll cover that in a bit. Now that you understand the idea behind these component-based frameworks, let's dive into some examples by looking at the anatomy of a SwiftUI view. Every view is defined as a struct of type view. Inside of that, views all require a certain body attribute. This is what tells the SwiftUI renderer what the contents of your view are. The body is of type sum view and is often represented with brackets after it. However, don't let that fool you because this representation with brackets is the exact same thing as using an equal sign. The brackets just make it more readable for SwiftUI users, but we'll talk about the importance of knowing the difference later. Let's start off with just trying to render some text. Now, this representation on screen is animated, but it is what would happen while you were doing this. If you would like to follow along, you can create an Xcode playground using SwiftUI and playground support to see these similar effects. At the end of the video, I'll be showing a real walkthrough of making an app with SwiftUI, so if you would like to just follow along then, that works too. To add the text, all we have to do is add a text object as our body and it just works. That's a common theme you'll start to see with this framework. A lot of it is intuitive and it just works. Great, text is cool and all, but what if I want to add an image too? Let's replace our text object with an image object. Once again, it just works. Alright, this is pretty nice, but what if I want to make something with multiple views? Perhaps an image with a caption of text below it. Let's try it the intuitive way. We'll add an image and a text object together and... We get an error? Why is that? Well, remember how the brackets around the body essentially represent an equal sign? Yeah, it's expecting only one object there and not the two that we provided. To look at it even deeper, let's try to take a look at how the SwiftUI renderer works from a high level. When it comes down to it, all the renderer is asking for is a new instance of our custom view. Inside of there, it extracts the body and figures out how to display it on the screen. With our first text-only example, this worked because our body was only one object. The same goes for our image-only example. 
However, for the text and image together examples, we were giving two objects when we were only supposed to be giving one. To explain this in another way, imagine you worked for a newspaper company. You've just written an amazing article and are ready to publish it. However, each article is only allotted enough space in the paper such that you can only have one image with each article. But you wanted to put two images in your article. It's not like the publisher is going to make room for your two images just because you asked for it. But you do have a trick up your sleeve. You go to a collage maker and stitch the two images together as if they were one. Then the publisher accepts it because it's only one full image and it all works. You're giving only one image, but in turn you're getting all the content you wanted to share. This is the same type of logic we need to apply for combining multiple views in SwiftUI. The equivalent of the collage maker from that example in SwiftUI is called a stack. A stack is a special type of view that takes in other views as its arguments. It does all the work of figuring out how to distribute views evenly and in the proper way, and in turn, you get one view as an output. However, it's not always that simple. SwiftUI is also known as a declarative UI system. The best way to understand this is to think about the opposite imperative UIs as being such that the user has to specifically tell how everything needs to be laid out, such as specific element positions. Declarative UI, on the other hand, is more of a hands-off approach. The user has to tell it the minimum amount of information, like how everything is to be relative to each other, and the renderer is to figure out the rest. Declarative UIs can make development much faster, but remember, we need to give the minimum amount of information. If we just provide a generic stack, how is the renderer supposed to know whether to lay the views horizontally, vertically, or any other way? That's where stack types come in. There are three in SwiftUI, hstacks, vstacks, and zstacks, and what each of them does is pretty self-explanatory. With all that information under your belt, you should now understand enough to make any combination of views together. But there's a bit of an issue when it comes to the style of things. While this Cupertino theme is nice and sleek, the App Store wouldn't be what it is without creative developers making cool designs. You want to do that too, you say? Well, it's easy in SwiftUI as well. Enter modifiers. Modifiers do, well, just that. They modify your views in a specific way. They exist in basically any layout system, but I feel as though the way SwiftUI tackles them is miles ahead of the others. In SwiftUI, similar to other frameworks, modifiers are just functions part of their views. However, SwiftUI takes the upper hand by implementing a design pattern known as the builder pattern. Let's take a look at how this works. Let's say we have a class called person with two functions, add hat and add boots. We also have a way of displaying the person. The typical way to make something like this would be with void functions, methods that return nothing. We would create a new instance of a person and create a line to add a hat. That's nice, but what if I want to add boots as well? I can do that with another line below it. The problem should start to appear now. For each modifier, we need a new line, and while it works, it does not sit well with the rest of the way SwiftUI is structured. For that reason, we implement the builder pattern. This entails one small change to our person class. Those void functions from before no longer return nothing, but rather they return self. Self is the equivalent of the this keyword in a language like Java, and it returns the current instance of the class. With this simple change, no longer do we have to write the code sloppily like before. Instead, it can all be written out cleanly like this, where we create the person class itself. This is exactly how SwiftUI modifiers work. Let's say I have a text object, but I want to make it green. All I have to do is call dot foreground color and set it to green. Want to add a border? I can do that too, by just calling dot border. There are loads of other functions you can use, and these are just a few examples. The final point you need to understand about these modifiers is that the order of them does in fact matter. For example, let's say I have this stack together. I want to make there be a little bit more space between the text and its border. I'm going to add a dot padding modifier to the end and it doesn't do what I wanted it to do. This is because by the time the padding modifier gets calculated, SwiftUI is treating the border text as its own view. It is no longer thought of as a piece of text, but rather is a collection of pixels. To achieve what we want, I will move the padding around to before the border call and now we have what we want. 
Just a small note, modifiers actually take that idea of everything being a view even further because of the nature of the builder pattern returning self and whatnot. At this point, you could become the greatest iOS developer of all time. You have the power to create virtually any layout you would. Alas, there exists one final issue. How can we interact with our app and update the views on screen accordingly? We do this through the magic of state management. State management is a term that gets thrown around a lot and often confuses people. There are tons of libraries for it and oftentimes they exist outside of the frameworks they operate within. The entire ecosystem can be really confusing and I think that's one of the main reasons a lot of people don't want to learn these new frameworks. Luckily, SwiftUI has it integrated directly into the library and is extremely easy to use. The concept behind states isn't hard to wrap your head around, so here's a simple explanation to get you going. Let's say we have a large SwiftUI view. There are several variables that feed into several different things. The important part to recognize here is that not all of these variables are going to change. If a variable is not going to change, SwiftUI does not need to waste its resources waiting for it to do so. Furthermore, let's say SwiftUI has a list of all the variables in a view that it knows might change. Anytime one of those values changes, SwiftUI isn't going to re-render the entire view. There's no need to. Chances are only one small thing on the view changed. All it needs to do is change the parts that need to be changed. Hopefully this is starting to make sense to you. The idea of state management is that you tell SwiftUI what variables you're going to change and what variables you won't. Then, anytime one of them changes, SwiftUI will only update the part of the new view that is different rather than spending more resources to update the whole view. In code, this is extremely easy to implement. Simply add the at state annotation before your variable declaration and it works right away. SwiftUI has a few other variable annotations such as binding and environment objects, but we'll be discussing some of them when we make our full app at the end of the video. By the way, if you've made it this far, leave a comment about whether or not I say the word framework too much. Alright, we've covered a lot so far in this video. We definitely haven't gone through every single view available, and haven't touched on some features like navigation at all. Hey, maybe if this video does well, I'll make another one for those. But that wasn't the point of this video. You guys should now have a solid understanding of how the framework was made and how it works conceptually and in code. Learning more views is not the easiest part because it'll come naturally to you. With that, I want to begin the part where we make our own to-do list app. Now, this video is already quite long, so I'll be going through this a little bit fast, but if you would like, the code for this example is linked in the description. When you're creating your Xcode project, Take note the interface and lifecycle settings are both set to SwiftUI. On the right hand side here is what is known as the SwiftUI canvas. As I make changes, it will update in real time to show me what is happening. To allow the users to interact with the app, I'm going to add a text field below this with a text variable. I'm going to bind that variable to the text field with a dollar sign and then style the whole thing a little bit. This is what it ends up looking like. Afterwards, I'm going to add a button next to the text field with an H stack. The action, or what happens when the button is pressed, is going to add to a list of to-dos. I'm also going to reset the text field at the end of that action. The button itself is going to say add, and this is what it's going to look like. To make it look a little better, I'm going through now and styling the button with things like padding, shadows, colors, and clip shapes. This is what the final button ends up looking like. On the canvas, you can interact with the components of your app by pressing the play button. I'll add a list below the text field to display all of our to-dos. This shifts up the rest of our UI. Inside, I'll put a for each. This will iterate through all of our to-dos, and for now, I'm just going to add text for each one. You can see instantly all of our to-dos get added, and it's this very nice scrollable list.
To allow for more complexity in our layout, I'm going to make a separate to-do item view for each item. This is just going to have a simple text variable, which is what the to-do is. For now, we're just going to have regular text like before, and it'll look the same. You can see I just plug in the to-do with our to-do item, and now it looks the same as before, but now we've got our own custom class in there. I'm now going to switch over to creating our own checkbox class. This checkbox is going to be based on images and it's going to have a binding variable of whether or not it's checked. This is going to act as a button which basically just toggles the checked variable when it's pressed. The image we're going to be using is going to be based off of system images. System images are images that are built into the operating system. You can find them using the SF Symbols app. I'll style the checkbox a bit more and now we can use it in our to-do item view. I'm utilizing Xcode's IDE tools to embed this in an H stack so I can put the checkbox before it. We need a state variable to determine whether or not a specific item is checked. Here we use the same dollar sign as before. Essentially what binding does is it allows a child, in this case the text box, to modify a state of its parent, the to-do item. I'll make the checkbox fit in a little bit better, and this is what it looks like. This is already a pretty good to-do app. We can check off these boxes and we can add items, but it would be nice if we could also delete items too. We can do this by utilizing gestures. I will add dot on long press gesture to each to-do item so that I can find it in the to-do list and remove it. Since the array is stateful, SwiftUI will automatically remove its corresponding row in the table. You can see I can click and hold and it's gone. A final touch we could add to make this look better would be animation. In SwiftUI is literally dead simple. I added the dot animation with the spring preset and look at that. Automatically we get sliding in and out animations in our app. Let's take a look at the final product. Wow, that's really not bad for just a few minutes of work. We have a fully animated table with checkable and removable to do's. All of this was with very little code too, showing the full potential of Swift UI. Alright, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up the video here. This video took a really long time to make, so I'd really appreciate if you guys could share it to people who you think may like it. Even if someone doesn't like it, go ahead and send it to them anyways. Annoy your friends. Okay, all jokes aside, if you have any other video suggestions, feel free to leave them in the comments. If you like SwiftUI and want to hear more about it, I gave a similar talk at the December 24 Hours of STEM conference, but I will also be uploading more content related to this framework in the upcoming weeks. So if you liked the video, hit that like button. If you didn't, I guess the other one works too. Either way, subscribe and share this video. Thank you and see you in the next one. Bye!